Our next speaker is Dr. Derek Sloan. Uh, Dr. Sloan is an infectious diseases physician. Um, he has worked extensively in Southern Africa. Um, he returned to complete a Wellcome Trust funded PhD fellowship at the University of Liverpool. Um, his work there was on the clinical pharmacology of TB treatment. In 2015, he spent three months in Sierra Leone working as clinical lead on the UK medical quality monitoring team, supporting the NHS contribution uh, to the Ebola virus uh, outbreak in West Africa. His ongoing research interests are targeted towards clinical therapeutics, questions of global public health, uh, particularly in the treatment of tuberculosis and other infections. Dr. Sloan. Thank you very much. Pour some water in case I get a dry throat. So what I thought I would do to try and continue the story that you've heard so far was try and maybe pick up the trail a little bit from the advent of antibiotic therapy for the management of tuberculosis in about the 1940s and 1950s, and then move relatively quickly to describe the tuberculosis challenge that we face globally today, and to think about ways in which we're doing well and ways in which we're doing not so well in trying to eliminate tuberculosis as a public health problem. And I've entitled my talk, Tell a Fish, Go Climb a Tree, which is a literary reference that I'll come back to at the end. So those of you who are of a literary bent can try and work out where that comes from if you get bored listening to me talking. Um, I won't go over my own personal story that much because it's already been revealed, but I guess my career as a doctor has followed two jumping between the two trails parallel tracks. I graduated from the University of Glasgow, spent some time working in Liverpool, and I now work in Fife between the Victoria Hospital and the University of St Andrews, but I've spent at least half of my working career in Africa. Um, I moved to Kenya in 2000, and the pictures in series along the bottom of that slide, I moved to Kenya in 2004 um, to, to work in a small missionary hospital um, called Chigoria Hospital that actually was initially set up by the Church of Scotland, I think. Um, and there I was working on an HIV program, trying to roll out HIV treatment for the first time to, to, to the population of that part of Meru district in Kenya. And tuberculosis struck me as a problem then. From there I moved to South Africa, where I lived very close to a herd of elephants next to a game park in KwaZulu-Natal. And I think my personal interest in tuberculosis really crystallized during the year and a bit I spent there. I worked as a district TB control officer and because nobody else wanted the job, in a health sub-district in KZ in KwaZulu-Natal, where we were notifying 3,000 tuberculosis patients per year, and we, where we really faced a rising tide of um, multi and then extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. And the mortality from tuberculosis and HIV in that hospital was such that I started my morning ward round every day by helping to carry the bodies out of the ward to the mortuary. It was that unbelievable place to work and an unbelievable time to be there. And we would carry three or four people in their 20s and 30s out of the ward to make space for the new patients in the morning. I think that experience of working as the TB control officer in that hospital was what shaped the remainder of my interest in tuberculosis. And I went back to Africa in 2010 to work in Blantyre in Malawi where I did a PhD in TB treatment. And although more recently I've become involved in an outbreak response for other infectious diseases worldwide. Um, tuberculosis really remains the disease that I'm most interested in the management and research of. And the spin-off benefits to being interested in a terrible disease is you get to go lots of not terrible places. And so I currently have research projects across much of southern and eastern Africa, but also in eastern Europe and in Vietnam. And some photographs on the right-hand side of this slide those are the TB nurses that I worked with on my time in Klebisa Hospital in South Africa. I was there for a year. Two of those women died during the course of that year of tuberculosis, so a terrible, terrible toll of the disease, not just on their population, but on the healthcare workers trying to deal with that population. 
my research team in Malawi and then some people I currently collaborate with in Vietnam. I'm going to talk mainly about antibiotics um, because I'm an infectious disease physician and I like giving people antibiotics. But when we talk about the treatment of tuberculosis and we talk about antibiotics for tuberculosis, immediately we have to put the role of antibiotics into a historical perspective. And I think for Western Europe, at least this graph, to me, picturally represents that historical perspective. Robert Koch identified the, the pathogen which causes tuberculosis in 1882. A vaccine was developed in the form of the BCG in the 1920s. Streptomycin was developed in the 1940s. And so the chemotherapy year, era for the management of tuberculosis is just this little bit at the end of the slide here. And already we were seeing an enormous decline in tuberculosis as a, or, or consumption as a, as a major public health pro problem in Western Europe over that time. And I think this really illustrates to us that the biomedical interventions that we have to treat the disease are not the main part of managing tuberculosis. Improvement in public health infrastructure, improvement in, in people's living circumstances and attempts to alleviate and reduce poverty are the things that we need to continue to do to manage tuberculosis. But I want to talk predominantly about antibiotics over the course of today. So I'll start with, with the with the streptomycin trial that, that, that has already been referred to in the earlier talks in the late 1940s, so conducted in London. Austin Bradford Hill is a statistician in the trial. One of the first examples of randomization um, in, a, in, a, in a clinical trial for, of a medical intervention, and randomization largely chosen as a way to select patients to have the drug because there wasn't enough of the drug. So it couldn't be given to everybody, and so some people got it and some people didn't on a random basis. One of the physicians in the trial is this chap who only died recently, Denny Mitchison, um, a chest physician in the Royal Brompton Hospital in the 1940s and 1950s. And I had a surreal experience in 2011 when I was working in the laboratory of the College of Medicine in Blantyre in Malawi, and I couldn't get the cultures to work in the lab. They were all being contaminated. And Denny Mitchison, aged about 94, Skyped me from London to Malawi to try and help me get my cultures to work. Continued to work um, and to help failing PhD students like myself fought well into his, his late 90s, um, but sadly passed away in the, in the last couple of years. The two important things to remember about that streptomycin trial were that it was, we showed that anti, or it was shown that antibiotics could prevent death from tuberculosis. The figure on the left-hand side here is the, from the original trial report. Slightly unusual in the way that it's laid out, but each little line across the course here represents an individual patient. This is after two months of treatment, and basically if you as a patient are above this horizontal line, you're doing all right. If you're below this horizontal line, you're not doing all right, and if you're black, you're dead. S were patients who were given streptomycin. C is patients who were given what was called the control therapy. The control therapy was go to bed and hope that it goes away. And you can see that the patients who received streptomycin at two months, at four months, and even at six months remained on the right side of the line, and the accumulation of black was predominantly on, 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 the, on the control side of the line. So streptomycin indicated as an antibiotic that would save lives from patients who had tuberculosis. But a salutary tale, almost immediately after the, 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 the revelation that this was an antibiotic curable disease, was this paper published by Denny Mitchison only a couple of years later. And what it showed this, on the y-axis of this graph, the number of bacteria that could be, of TB bacteria that could be retrieved from the sputum of people who were coughing and were on treatment for tuberculosis. Single drug therapy with TB. You're doing all right up until about day 70, then the bacteria are going away. If you continue to treat a patient with TB only with streptomycin, it doesn't look so good after day 70. The bacteria stop going away and they start coming back. And the top figure indicates reductions in responsiveness to antibiotic therapy over time of the TB bacteria. So that's from two times less up to six times less effective. And you can see already, only two years after the identification of streptomycin as an anti-tuberculous antibiotic, the notion that given an isolation eventually, in fact not eventually, quite quickly, the bug became resistant to the antibiotic. So not only the first indication that antibiotics cure infectious diseases, not only when it, one of the very first clinical trials, but 
a salutary warning about the risk of antimicrobial resistance, which of course we face across all infectious pathogens worldwide now. So real important history of, of medicine in those trials and in those early years of TB treatment. What happened after that was things progressed pretty quickly up into the 1960s and the 1970s. So soon after streptomycin was identified, a, a drug called paraaminosalicylic acid, which we call PAS, came along too. And then the drugs that are, that are labelled in red in this slide are the drugs that we still use today. So quickly discovered a drug called eyes and eyes, a very potent drug at killing TB bacteria. And then we started to realise that if we combined the drugs together and gave two or three of them at once, we could cure patients and it didn't cause this risk of resistance. So, multi, so, so moving on to this idea that if you give multi-drug combination therapy, then you cure tuberculosis, then you can not only cure the disease but prevent the emergence of resistance. But the, the course of treatment, the duration was 18 months. In the 1970s, the real set, very important trials conducted, predominantly the British MRC in East Africa, identified that if you added two more drugs to the treatment of tuberculosis, rifampicin and pirazinamide, then you could shorten the course of treatment from 18 months down to six months. Six months was short course chemotherapy for the treatment of tuberculosis, and that's still the duration of TB treatment today, six months. And then we introduced a new drug called the Eisenat, called the Thambutol, and we've just really just tinkered with the regimen since then, since about the early 1980s. We've had the same drugs in slightly varying combinations, and this has been our standard treatment regimen since 2004. Rifampus and Eisenazid, Perizinamide, the Thambutol for two months, Rifampus and Eisenazid for another four months. They didn't realize it at the time, but at the end of but in, in the in the 1970s, they conducted the fourth of six East African collaborative trials in tuberculosis. And this really was the high watermark in getting TB treatment better and easier for patients to take. We wanted to make it shorter and shorter and shorter so it was easy for people to take it. So these are a bunch of different treatment combinations that they used in that trial, trying to get down from six months to only four months of treatment. And the sort of 3D graphic shows that after two months, the number of patients who were still coughing TB bacteria from their sputum was starting to go down. After four months, it was really starting to go down and you stopped treatment. But a little bit after that, and up to 40% of patients, particularly if you didn't use this drug rifampicin in the regimen, after completion of therapy, you relapsed. And that's as far as we have got in the management of tuberculosis until the present day. We cannot shorten first-line TB treatment less than six months because the patients start to relapse. 20, 30, 40% of them start to relapse after completion of therapy. And that's, at the time, this was still, this was not particularly discouraging. Today, looking at that graph is really discouraging because we still haven't done any better than that in the intervening period. So that's where we are now. We diagnose tuberculosis because people cough it up in their sputum. We see it on microscope slides, we grow it in the laboratory, we've now got fancy tests that just look for the, the, the TB DNA and can tell us very quickly whether it's present or not. Our patients predominantly felt present with lung disease, pulmonary disease, and classically the bacteria eat away at the substance of the lung and create these things called cavities, which are holes in the lung field that fill up with bacteria, and you can cough them out. Your lungs being destroyed from the inside, and as you're coughing them out, you're aerosolizing the bacteria for other people to become infected too. But I put this image up to remind us that 15% of, um, of patients with tuberculosis um, have known pulmonary disease. So these little white bits here and, and what's generally a black picture are TB in the spine. So spinal tuberculosis. We're still stuck with that six-month duration of therapy. We use four drugs for two months. The two most important ones are the top two, eyes and eyes. It kills TB bacteria very quickly, and rifampicin kills TB bacteria for a long time. It can kill the ones that the other drugs can't kill, and that's why we can get treatment a little bit shorter down to six months. And, and apart from some very difficult to treat forms of non-pulmonary tuberculosis, you're finished treatment six months into it. So that's where we are. Tuberculosis treatment cures the disease. None of those drugs are very expensive anymore. They can be acquired cheaply, and in fact, they're available for free in WH World Health Health Organization schemes in most countries in the world. If you take your treatment for six months, there's about a 95% chance that you will be cured. So it's safe, cheap, effective treatment. Furthermore, if you treat tuberculosis effectively, Within one or two weeks of starting therapy, the drugs reduce the number of bacteria you can cough out in your sputum so much that you can't infect anybody else. So we've got effective therapy that cures the disease and interrupts treatment. 
We've had it since the 1960s. So why haven't we got rid of the disease? We've got an effective therapy that cures it and prevents transmission from person to person, and yet we just we're nowhere near eradicating the disease. In fact, this is what's happened since 1990. That's the World Health Organization map of global tuberculosis on a worldwide scale in 1990. You can see that, 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 that maybe the, the little legend at the bottom, rates per 100,000. So there was like a, a 100 cases per 100,000 population per year in some bits of southern Africa and India in 1990. Most of the world was much lower than that. There was a real perception at that point that tuberculosis was going to be eliminated, I think. The graph on the right-hand side is a graph I had to put together for a talk a few years ago explaining what happened after 1990. And you can see that up until the mid-2000s, there was a year-on-year -year rise in the number of tuberculosis cases being reported worldwide. Lots and lots and lots more patients, up to um, somewhere in the region of nine. Or the, the, the blue line is a sort of global e estimate, and the red lines above and below are the sort of error margins for that estimate. But somewhere between eight and 10 million patients being infected by, with tuberculosis falling sick from tuberculosis per year around 2005, 2006, the time when I was working in South Africa, really the peak of the global TB epidemic. Things got so bad that in 1993, just three years after that graph I showed on the left side, for the first time ever, the World Health Organization declared a single disease a global health emergency. They'd never done it before. They said tuberculosis is a global health emergency. And since then, there have been a variety of initiatives, Stop TB Campaign, um, international attempts to try and control tuberculosis over the course of the last 20 or 30 years. Yet tuberculosis remains the biggest cause of death from an infectious disease worldwide. It's responsible for a quarter of preventable adult deaths worldwide. And somebody dies of tuberculosis about every 20 seconds. That's the state of the epidemic in 2018. Things have actually got a bit better in the last 10 or 15 years. But if you, if you remember the blue from the graph of 1990, the highest number was 100. The highest global instance was 100 cases per 100,000 population per year. Two or three times that are the number of TB notifications even now. And that's from last year's World TB report. The data is actually from 2017, but it was reported in 2018. So that begs the question, why are we not doing better? We've had treatment for decades. We've had medical advance in all spheres of life for decades, yet we've had progressive deterioration in our ability to control tuberculosis up until maybe 10 or 15 years, or up until maybe 10 years ago when things started to get a bit better. And I think there are three main explanations for our failure to manage tuberculosis very well in the course of the last um, well, in the 1980s and 1990s in particular. Firstly, I think it's inescapable that tuberculosis remains a disease of crushing poverty. The graph on the left-hand side illustrates that really um, emphatically, I think, on a global scale. So the y-axis of that graph is how much tuberculosis exists in your country, and the, and the, the, the digits on the, on the x-axis ask what the GDP is of individual countries and each little marker is an individual country. If, you're high up, if your GDP is high, your TB is low. If your, if your GDP is low, then your TB is high. A really strong inverse correlation. Our failure to tackle um, extreme poverty on the global scale has prevented us from, from eliminating tuberculosis. Two specific things, I think, happened in the 1980s and the 1990s that made things a lot worse. The destruction and, or the collapse of health systems in former Soviet Union resulted in the breakdown of TB control programs across, across mass, vast swathes of, of Russia and other countries. And in particular, in prisons, tuberculosis became a... Prisons in Russia became like a tuberculosis incubator through much of the, 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 the period in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. And I still work with people in Moldova where they're battling real difficult and impossible to manage multidrug resistant tuberculosis problems in that part of the world. So the collapse of some public health systems driven by big changes in global politics are in some way responsible for that. And then the thing that really has driven HIV in Southern Africa was the emergence, sorry, of TB in Southern Africa was the emergence of HIV. It's much more easy to become infected with tuberculosis if you're HIV infected. It's much more difficult to 
for the disease to be detected quickly if you're HIV infected, and the likelihood that you would go from the transition period from being asymptomatically infected to being very sick is much shorter if you're HIV infected. And the two graphs, I think, illustrate that. So the red line in the top graph takes parts of Africa where HIV prevalence is high. And you can see that compared to the rest of the world, TB incidence mushroomed in those countries. And the graph, which you might not see so well in the bottom, the blue line's London, the green line's New York, who have continued to gradually eliminate tuberculosis from the, throughout the course of the 20th century. The red line's Cape Town in South Africa. Exponential rise in tuberculosis cases from the 1980s, 1990s onwards. And it's only just starting to drop now since about 2010. So in the little bit of time I've got left, I want to talk a little bit through how do we deal with that now. There's been a real attempt, I think, since the WHO declared tuberculosis a global emergency in 1993 to, to tackle the problem. Some big Millennium Development Goals were set around managing and improving tuberculosis. The Stop TB campaign fought hard to, to, to reduce the incidence of tuberculosis by half between 1990 and 2015. And we have started to see improvements. But here are the areas where we are starting to do a little bit better but where we have to do a lot better if we're going to meet the challenge that was, um, that, that's was that been laid out before us. Firstly, we have to find the patients and make the diagnosis. Secondly, we have to make treatment easier to successfully complete. We still quaintly call six-month chemotherapy for tuberculosis short-course treatment. There is no other infectious disease where we think six months is a short course of treatment. It should be one week, it should be two weeks. Six month chemotherapy is as short as it goes. Take you back to that graph where we couldn't get it any shorter because of the risk of relapse. So we have to make it easier to successfully complete treatment. In the course of the last 10, 15 years, that problem of resistance if you don't give enough drugs in the right combination has really increased. So like all infectious diseases, we start to worry about drug resistance. We still we need to fund more research, particularly into d disease prevention strategies like vaccination, and most crucially, and to make all of one, two, three, and four work. We need to engage and maintain the political will in the fight against tuberculosis. And there have been real wins in that regard, I think, in the course of the last 10 years or so, but maintaining the level of interest and investment um, is a crucial challenge if we're to make much more progress. Or maybe if I've got a few moments to go through at least some of those categories and talk about them in a little bit more detail. So we have to find the patients. You can't cure someone from tuberculosis if, you haven't, if they haven't turned up in your clinic. We reckon, and this was the big campaign for World TBD in 2014, we reckon when we look at the sort of prevalence and incidence and, 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 and epidemiology studies of how much TB there is in the world, we reckon there's somewhere in the region of 9 million new TB cases per year worldwide, and we reckon that about 3 million of them never reach a healthcare clinic to access treatment. So how do we find the missing patients? We call those populations hard to reach. They're, they're in prison, or they're, um, they're living in shanty towns, or they're living far away from healthcare facilities, and we say that these are hard to reach patients and hard to reach populations. Increasingly, we have to think differently. We're offering a service, it's not the patients that's hard to reach. It's the healthcare facilities that are hard to reach. We have to stop expecting them to find us, and we have to go and find them. This notion of hard to reach populations transfers the blame on the care seeker, and we have to make ourselves more accessible to tackle that problem. And there's two examples of that on the right-hand side. So the Find and Treat scheme run by Al Story, in, uh, mainly through UCL in London. They've got a van, they drive around homeless shelters, they drive around people living in the streets. Um, people who work in the van are healthcare advocates, some of whom are tuberculosis patients themselves. They've got an x-ray machine, they've got, they've got microscopy facilities in the van, and they try to take the diagnosis to the patients. From an African setting, we talk about active case findings. So that's the Detect TB study that a colleague of mine or a friend of mine, Liz, Corbin, ran a few, Liz Corbett, ran a few years ago in South Africa. So taking a van out, knocking people's doors door to door, could you give me a sputum sample? I wonder if, you, if you've got a cough, you might have tuberculosis. Come out to the van, submit a sputum sample. This notion of, of active case finding to find those missing patients. When you find a peep, someone who thinks they've got tuberculosis, most of the time they're coughing. You have to capture or sputum, and you have to find out if there's TB bacteria in it. Up until very recently, that's been quite a difficult thing to do, and this series of pictures is supposed to um, 
this series of pictures is supposed to illustrate that for you. So that's a person working in a, in a healthcare facility in Malawi, wearing a mask to try and prevent himself, taking a bit of somebody's sputum, putting it on a microscope slide, heating it to make it dry, staining it, looking it under a microscope. And what you're looking for are these little red streaks, we call them acid fast bacilli, and those are TB bacteria inside the patient's sputum sample. And until very recently, that was the way of diagnosing tuberculosis in the vast majority of the world. It takes an awful lot of time, it takes an awful lot of patience, and if you have to do it for very long, it's a pretty boring activity. And it consumes an enormous amount of laboratory work or time, and of course, it's very user-dependent. So to try and make the diagnosis easier to make and trying to move away from this smear microscopy, there have been a few useful in innovations recently. So we've developed fluorescent microscopy tools. It's a lot easier to see a fluorescent bacteria than it is to see this, and so, and so the microscopists can work a lot faster to make the diagnosis easier in some patients. It's important to be able to grow the TB bacteria even from patients where you haven't seen it on a microscope slide. So we culture the patient's sputum. But it can take three or six weeks for the culture to become positive. The patient can't wait for the result for that period of time. But we've got more advanced liquid culture techniques that enable us to do it a little bit better. And a real breakthrough heralded in about 2010 was this machine. It's called the Gene Expert machine. You just cough into the pot. You transfer the pot into this little cartridge. You shove this cartridge in a machine and you press on and you wait for an hour and a half. And the machine does something. But what it does is it extracts the DNA from the sputum and tells you whether there's TB there or not. And so it turns this laborious user-dependent process into an automated test. And that's transformed our ability to diagnose tuberculosis up to a point. But a microscope slide costs about 10 cents. This machine costs about $50,000, and every individual cartridge costs about $15. So there are economies of scale to using these new tools in the diagnosis of tuberculosis in resource-poor countries. Do you know what that is? Is anybody, is anybody a Celtic supporter? Hmm? It's a goal. It's the second goal when... Um, I can't remember who scored it. It's the second goal of Celtic's win in, uh, in, in, I'm not a Celtic supporter. It's the second goal of the European Cup final in 1967. Can, you remember, can anyone remember who scored the goal? I can't remember off the top of my head. Say again? I don't think it was, Bobby Murdoch, was it? But anyway, whoever it was suffered from tuberculosis meningitis, from TB meningitis uh, in Glasgow. Uh, when he was a small child and was one of the first people to survive TB meningitis. And the purpose of that slide is to just remind us that um, patients who have pulmonary tuberculosis and who cough up the bacteria at least provide us with a way of making the diagnosis. Extra pulmonary TB in other parts of the body is really hard to diagnose because you can't even get the sample out. You can't even get the sample out of the patient. And here's some examples of that. A patient with a big, swollen heart with fluid around the heart because there's TB in the pericardium. A patient of mine in Liverpool who had a terrible big TB abscess in the brain. And these are particularly high risk and difficult to treat patients because it's really hard to make the diagnosis. TB anywhere except the lungs. People who are HIV infected can become very, very sick from tuberculosis because they don't, and the diagnosis is hard to make because they don't, they become ill when there are less bacteria in the lung. So when there's less bacteria in the lung, they're harder to find. And so HIV, TB diagnosis is hard to make. Tuberculosis in children is a phenomenally neglected disease. About 10% of, of tuberculosis cases worldwide occur in children. And until very recently, we had no effective way of diagnosing it. And we've just used the same medication that we use in adults and just tried to downscale the dose. Only in the last few years, the World Health Organization tried to tackle pediatric tuberculosis as a separate problem. So these are particularly high risk groups. I then want to go on and talk a little bit about making the, di making the treatment of tuberculosis easier. So the duration of TB treatment is still six months long. Six months is really hard to do for an individual patient. You have to see them every month. They feel sick to start with. You say, remember to take your tablets. They say, of course I'm going to make, remember to feel, take my tablets. I feel crap. Two weeks later, I don't feel quite so crap. A month later, I don't feel crap at all. And I've still got five months to go. The level of intense support that's required to get patients through their TB treatment is quite difficult. Now imagine you're working in southern Africa, and there's just you, and there's 3,000 of them to get through in a year enormously difficult to get patients through six months of chemotherapy. So in the 1990s, the World Health Organization introduced this thing called the DOT strategy. 
And a key pillar of the DOT strategy was directly observed treatment. To make sure you took all the tablets of your TB medication, you were supposed to show up somewhere every single day and take your treatment in front of somebody else who signed a little piece of paper to say you'd done it. And you could take that back to your clinic to have your drugs issued every two to four weeks. It was, that it was an attempt to try and control TB treatment, prevent the emergence of resistance, and make cure happen. So we tried to implement the DOT strategy in the hospital I worked with in South Africa. We put these posters up everywhere, suggesting that if you didn't take your tablets, you were going to die. And if you did take your tablets, you were going to end up like Popeye or something. <laughs> um, we had these f guys who had the most appalling taste in shirts, who would, uh, and that was our team, they would drive around the health district to try and find people who weren't take, taking their tablets and give them into trouble and tell them to do it. With, with these massive registers in all of the clinics trying to keep every patient on file. That's my wife sitting in the back of a car while I was driving around looking for someone who'd gone missing off their treatment. It was almost impossible to do. In fact, it wasn't almost impossible to do. It was impossible to do. And those were the outcomes for 2005 when we were trying to manage TB in Clavisa subdistrict. We lost about 30% of the patients that we started in therapy. Not that we knew that they died, or not that we knew they'd failed treatment, or not that something had gone wrong. They just stopped coming back to clinic, and we couldn't go and find them anymore. And the consequence of that problem, particularly in southern Africa, was that there was the growing emergence of this thing called multidrug resistant tuberculosis. People half-heartedly taking their antibiotics, stopping early, then going back a few weeks later to get some medicine because they got enough money to go on the bus. And the real emergence of these forms of drug resistant tuberculosis are very, very difficult to treat. And whilst the DOT strategy was a in some ways an effective and well-intentioned approach to trying to switch time slightly, a very well-intentioned approach to try and shorten or to try and get people through tuberculosis treatment. The reality was that it worked up to a point, but it's not going to work completely unless we can make the treatment duration shorter than the current requirement of six months. And currently people are working hard to try and do that. And there are three main approaches that are being deployed worldwide to try and do that. We're looking at the doses of the TB medications we give. So the most crucial medications is one called rifampicin. We give it at a dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram to each patient. That dose was set in the early 1960s. It was set partly to try and make treatment affordable and to give the lowest dose you could so you could give it to lots and lots of people. And what we've discovered over the past four or five years working with this group of people called the Panacea Consortium who do clinical trials in southern Africa, is that you can actually give people three or four times that dose of rifampicin. And what it probably does is if you put the dose up, your ability, this line shows that if you put the dose up, your ability to remove tuberculosis bacteria from the sputum increases too. So maybe if we increase the doses of the medications we we'll use, we could give less of it in the long term. Unfortunately, as you increase the dose, some people start to have side effects, and liver toxicity and jaundice is a real side effect of TB treatment. So the balance between giving more and giving it safely is still a struggle. Trying to use different antibiotics in combination. So there were, in 2014, there were three really big clinical trials published in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Going back to that graph from earlier on, can we shorten TB treatment from six months down to four months? And they all tried to use a class of antibiotics called the fluoroquinolones, and they all failed. That's just the same as in 1978, 1979. The patients seemed to be okay at four months, and then an unacceptable proportion of them relapsed. So this is a clinical trial that's running currently using entirely new combinations of drugs. Another attempt to get treatment down from six months to four months. And a slightly controversial approach, we know that if you only give treatment to people for four months, about 30 or 40 percent of them will relapse. So you could take the view that we have to give everybody longer treatment, or you could take the view that that's actually quite a good outcome for 60 percent of your patients, and you could try and work out who they were and treat them for a shorter period of time and reserve the prolonged treatment for the people who are at greatest risk. And so there's a thing called the truncate TB trial, trying to individualize therapy so that patients who are doing well can stop treatment early and allocate extra resources to patients who are doing badly. But that's a real game changer because to treat millions of people with a healthcare workforce who are not highly educated, it's much easier to tell them they have to give everybody the same thing than it is to say, give that guy six months treatment, give that woman two months treatment, give that guy four months treatment. So the individualization of therapy is very, very difficult. Because we failed to make TB treatment shorter, 
this problem of drug-resistant tuberculosis has become a bigger and bigger and bigger concern. Non-completed therapy, partially taken therapy, bacteria that are getting used to the antibiotics but aren't being killed by them. And your figures speak for themselves. Even since 2009, the number of cases of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis that's resistant to the two main first-line drugs has more than doubled, and there's now over half a million cases in the world notified every year. The problems I've just described for drug-sensitive disease are much, much worse than drug-resistant disease. We only find half of the patients. We only get 20% of the patients we find onto effective therapy, and only half of them are ever cured. We talk now about extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis that are resistant to more and more and more of the drugs that we've got, and forms of tuberculosis that, in fact, are almost untreatable and herald a, a journey back to the pre-antibiotic era in many cases. Just a slide very quickly to try and illustrate how much more difficult it is to treat drug-resistant and drug-sensitive TB. This is your standard six months treatment. And whilst I've outlined some problems with it, at least we know what drugs to use, at least it's based on a clinical trial, and there's only, the drugs are normally tolerable. Patients don't normally get sick. Once you've started to get drug-resistant tuberculosis, you can't use these first-line drugs that are generally quite good, so you have to use second-line drugs. Second-line drugs don't work as well, so you have to give them for longer. They're also less clean and they're a bit more toxic, so the patients start to feel sick during the course of the therapy. And until very recently, treatment took two, up to two years or more to cure someone of multidrug-resistant tuberculosis with less effective, more toxic medications and no clinical trials evidence behind the regimens that we were using. picture of Bob Dylan to remind us that the times are changing in tuberculosis treatment. Only in the course of the last 10 years has there been a chink of light, I think, in the management of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. We've licensed two new drugs since about 2013, one called Bedaquil and one called Dilaminid. This was the concoction of medications that until very recently had to be taken every single day if you had multidrug resistant tuberculosis. A daily injection, normally intramuscularly because it was difficult to give it intravenously. So that's a needle in your bum every day for eight months. Plus all of these tablets on top. But by combining some of these new medications together, we can now treat really what it looks like the preliminary trial data is suggesting that we could treat someone with extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis with a small pill burden and only for a period of six to nine months and achieve cure rates of something like 80 to 85%. So it's possible that the game is really going to change in the management of drug-resistant tuberculosis because of the introduction in the last few years of these new antibiotics. And that's very positive, but we're also starting to see stories like this in the small print of the big journals. Already we have resistance to our new drugs. So are we going to have another wave of drug-resistant tuberculosis removing our new agents as quickly as we introduce them? So that's all about treatment. What about vaccination? Can we give people a vaccine to stop them getting infected with tuberculosis? We know that there's a big long delay between getting infected with tuberculosis and falling sick from the, the disease. You can carry the bacteria asymptomatically. So can you, give a, can you give a vaccine to break the barrier between infection and disease? We've only got BCG invented in the 1920s, but there are 12 new vaccine candidates in some form of clinical trials. And then the last thing I want to say, because we are running a, bit, I'm, I'm running a little bit over time, I'm sorry. The question ultimately, I think, comes down to political will and financial investment. We did well up until about 2015. We reduced incidence of tuberculosis worldwide by about 50%. And so we've set these new goals that by the middle of this century, we'll reduce TB cases by 80%. We'll reduce mortality by 90%. For the first time ever, there was a high-level meeting at the UN in September of last year. But this is our current trajectory in the elimination of tuberculosis. This is the trajectory we need to achieve the, 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 sorry, the UN development goals. We invest more than we ever have in tuberculosis research and control, 724 million US dollars in 2016, but it's estimated that that's about a third of what we need if we were to achieve the goals. And so I apologize for slightly overrunning, but to come back to the initial title of the talk, every time I manage a patient with tuberculosis, particularly when I'm working overseas, I'm reminded, by, I'm reminded of this um, poem by Bertolt Brecht. When we come to you, our rags are ripped and torn, and you listen all over our naked bodies looking for a biomedical solution. As to the cause of our illness, a glance at our rags would be more revealing. One, cause and this, one and the same cause wears out our bodies and our clothes. 
Inventing new diagnostics and new antibiotics isn't the solution to tuberculosis. So there's a much bigger societal problem than that. And Brecht goes on to describe a patient with a different disease, and he says to the patient, your prescription says put on more weight. You might as well tell a fish, go climb a tree. If we want to eliminate tuberculosis, we need solutions which are realistic and accessible. We don't need a six-month course of antibiotics that the majority of the world cannot get patients to consistently take. And that's why we need ongoing investment, and that's why we need political will to solve the problem. Thank you.